as many of you know, I stood against Jack Straw in Blackburn at the last election. People in that constituency have been wearing the niqab for many, many years, certainly for all the time he's been MP. Why now, suddenly, for the first time, did it start to worry him? It was a considered, calculated move in a column written quietly in private and submitted to the newspaper. And an effort to jump onto a bandwagon of Islamophobia that was so quickly followed up by other cabinet members that there can be no doubt that it was planned beforehand. You know, uh, this fear of a strip of cloth is not entirely new in the UK. I was actually going to come and speak to you in my kilt today. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't do it because we're a bit near the fire limit and I was a bit worried about the possible effects of an outbreak of uncontrolled lust. <laughs> However, 250 years ago, not that long ago, the wearing of the kilt was punishable by death. By 200 years ago, it had got not quite so draconian and it was only punishable by transportation. <laughs> Why there's so many craigs in Australia. But that kind of ridiculous attitude to costume is not one I thought we'd see a government in this country attempting to bring back. I'm not a Muslim myself. I'm not particularly religious myself. I believe that Islam, like other religions, contains a great deal of its good in its ethical teaching. I also believe that Islam, like other religions, is capable of being perverted by leadership structures for evil as well as for good. I'm not here to defend Islam in particular. I am here to defend everybody's freedom to pursue their own religion. And that is what everybody in this hall believes in. When I was in Uzbekistan, I saw many people tortured for their religion. Tortured with terrible tortures, including boiling alive, including mutilation of the genitals, drowning. And the West was receiving intelligence from Uzbekistan via the CIA as a result of that torture. And it's worth noting, when Tony Blair talks and the Americans talk, perhaps we'll open a dialogue with Iran and Syria at the same time that on the surface They've been talking about Syria as the axis of evil. They've regularly been sending Muslims to Syria to be tortured as part of the extraordinary rendition program. That's how genuine their motives are. As a result of this torture, I saw in Uzbekistan, I challenged within the system intelligence which was simply untrue, which vastly exaggerated the strength of Al-Qaeda which named individuals as members of Al-Qaeda who plainly were not, not just in Uzbekistan, but throughout the world. I queried this, I questioned it, I was summoned back to meetings in London, and where I said we are getting intelligence which is not true, I was told it is operationally useful. Nobody ever argued with me when I said it was untrue, but they said it was operationally useful because that is how intelligence is judged nowadays. The intelligence on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction was untrue, but it was operationally useful if your purpose was to start an illegal war. And false intelligence, which vastly exaggerates the strength of Al-Qaeda and exaggerates the so-called Islamic extremist threat to the UK, is operationally useful to them now because they can use it to blacken Muslims and stir up Islamophobia in the UK. And that is what we are now seeing. And when Eliza Manning and Buller claims there are 1,600 active terrorists, not sympathisers, active Muslim terrorists in the UK. She is not exaggerating. She is not hyping. She is lying and deliberately lying.
That's quite enough of Eliza Manning and Hitler, or whatever their name is. <laughs> you know, we are seeing such a tide of Islamophobia, such a tide of Islamophobia stoked by government ministers, not just private individuals, reflected in the media so that anything a Muslim does is front page news, no matter how small, no matter if it's a matter of planning permission for a prayer room in Windsor. That's worse than a murder by a non-Muslim. How have we got to this stage? We've got to this stage because the government has deliberately stoked it. And they stoked it to create a climate of fear so that when we hear of the deaths of 650,000 people in Iraq or 100,000 people in Afghanistan or people to come in Iran or elsewhere, they hope but we will see Muslims as dehumanized and they won't get the public protest because people, ordinary, will think, ordinary people will just think, well, they were only Muslims and they're trying to kill us too. We are not going to fall for this trick. The British people have not accepted it and we will not accept it. I was not afraid to tell the government hard truths. I have not been afraid to continue to tell hard truths since I left, and I'm not afraid to tell some hard truths which are uncomfortable for us in the anti-war movement as well. One of these truths is that sadly, the Muslim community is unaware, is sleepwalking towards disaster, and is still retaining a pathetic loyalty to the Labour Party, which is persecuting it. When I stood against Jack Straw in Blackburn, I was not allowed to enter any mosque in the constituency due to a decision by the Lancashire Council of Mosques. Yvonne Ridley had similar problems in Leicester. That has not massively changed. We've had huge effort by our part to explain what is happening, to get it over, to get through patriarchal systems, to get through tribal and other loyalties, to involve people in democratic politics in a reasoned way, not a Tammany Hall way, without that effort. We are not going to make progress. We have to be out there. I see many people at meetings in London. I see many intellectuals from the Muslim community expressing themselves with me on university platforms and in newspaper columns. Where I need to see people is out there with me when I'm speaking and campaigning and knocking on doors in Bolton and Bradford and Blackburn, because that is where this will be won, on the streets, on the streets. I was a member of the Anti-Nazi League back in the 70s and 80s, in the days when Peter Hayne and Phil Wallace were on our side of the barricades, not on the side with the racists. I know it can be done. I know Islamophobia can be beaten back, but it's a long, hard and unglamorous grind, and we need all of us there, in there, fighting together. Thank you.